Right. So this is a really short roundup of the, the various ways in which we um, distribute software in KDE, and Jonathan's going to start us off. KDE is now all about the applications. We make many fine applications. We make many uh, decent applications, and we make a few kind of rubbish applications. And we should care about making sure that our applications get to the users, so the users uh, get a good experience. And uh, the first thing we need to do is actually tell the users what applications we make. So I spent some time earlier working on some earlier work done by Harold uh, to actually get an up-to-date website listing all of the applications and projects, and there's 183 of them, and they're finally listed on our website. This feels like an like a, a important uh, project that should have been done yonks ago and for some reason hasn't been done. Um, and there's still lots of work to be done. What's on my slides? Yes, there's still lots of work to be done for it. Uh, so firstly, people need to pay attention to what's on here, uh, and make sure that the screenshots are up to date and the icons are up to date and that the icons are complete in the Breeze icon theme. And um, this doesn't yet link to app stores. It links to app stream URLs, which is, here's the generic uh, ID for the uh, program. Um, but which distributions actually use those and which package managers use those, I'm not quite sure. Um, the URL specification itself was kind of broken, so we were probably the first people to use it, and we had to get fixes into the specification for it to be used, which are still working their way into Discover Our Software Manager. Um, so we now have a shiny list of everything that we actually make, um, including a, a manually maintained list of the unmaintained ones, because we don't have a good way of saying, well, this software is no longer useful and it's no longer maintained, so uh, time to say, that's, that's done with, but we don't have a good way to do that. Uh, in, the, in the categorization that already exists for the programs because of obscure reasons with the translations and whatnot. Uh, so I also have to maintain a list of, uh, of unmaintained applications, which feels like a definite kludge in our process. But given that the app stream data, you feel free to comment if you, if you have a comment. <laughs> given that the app stream data that we use to make this website uh, then gets used by the app stores. It means that you fix it once there, it gets fixed everywhere. Here it is in GNOME Software Manager where they promoted uh, Jay Compre recently, a good choice. The title should be called App Stream Gets Around, I think. <laughs> this yes. is that image. Yep. Uh, so we're not very good at telling uh, projects, why they should become KDE projects, why they should uh, join our community and get through the slight bureaucratic hurdles uh, rather than um, rather than just throw it on, on GitHub or whatever. Uh, and there's all these good reasons, but we're not terribly good at uh, promoting those good reasons to the different projects. Um, and then we get about as far as here at the minute, uh, releasing the software where we tend to dump a tarball, uh, but we're not very good at doing the post-release stuff and making sure it gets to users and making sure that uh, it updates. Yeah, so you make a tar and maybe you tell uh, Albert to do it, um, to take care of releasing it, or they release it themselves. And maybe you write a blog, but then how does it actually get to the users? We as KDE community need to start caring a lot more about making sure our software gets to the users in a useful way. So the most popular way for getting to users, we'll have Luca talk to us. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I'm covering this from a slightly different perspective because many of you know about software distributions. I'm talking about the fact that the traditional way of uh, providing a, a software to the users is a little more than getting a, a, a tarball, doing some fancy magic, and getting out a package which is a RPM, DEB, Tabor, whatever you, you want. Basically, what we do integrators, I say integrators because distributions are integrators, but also other projects like uh, the Linux, Linux in Munich was a kind of integrator as well, is made to, con to ensure consistency and safety for a system. Compatible licensing, it sounds like easy, but especially with historical code base, KDE PIM as a, as a very prominent example, that it has problems. Integration with underlying system, which means will, your, will this library work with your software or it will break in unexpected ways? And lastly, to make sure that the binary is exactly uh, the same given the same tarball. This is an effort by Debian and other pro projects that do this kind of thing. Recently, 
there have been some contrasts between upstreams and downstreams uh, over the way, the right way to do uh, software, uh, how to distribute it. You, did it. you do this wrong. No, you, you are doing this wrong and whatnot. But it turns out that, well, everyone is actually making mistakes all the time. It's human. And both upstreams and downstreams, this is famous, the famous uh, SSH vulnerability in Debian from about more than 10 years ago that basically broke uh, the security of SSH, a bad patch. This one is more recent. It's a, a, a mistakenly pre-release framework stable ended up ending up in KDE Neon. This, the, <laughs> of course, I'm not pointing fingers. This is the thing I, I, I thought, but I'm, I'm personally broke cute in OpenSUSE, so I'm not to blame myself. Uh, upstream, for example, KSTAS had for a, a number of um, uh, months uh, and a helper for KOS that was basically omnipotent and could do anything to your system directories. It was then removed because it wasn't working, luckily, for its intended purpose. But it was a, a very threat to your system. Or this one is actually a failure of both upstreams and downstreams. There was a local privilege escalation in, in KWallet PAM. Well, the, no one noticed upstream and n not even the downstreams because they shipped it without noticing. It came up when doing a review, uh, when packaging it in OpenSUSE uh, a number of um, months ago. Okay, I say do not fight, cooperate because no one will have the perfect recipe to uh, deliver software, which means even upstreams and downstreams can have different opinions and still cooperate on this. For example, there are a couple of uh, examples here where you, I see that upstream and downstream cooperate well. This one is about a, a few uh, years old. When uh, the Novo driver was there, Plasma would freeze, and both people from the Plasma team and from the OpenSUSE KDA team actually uh, had fixed it. This one has a very big uh, improvement in here. One minute, okay. And. Uh, People that actually contribute uh, uh, other code fixes everywhere. So uh, not, let's not forget the people that work downstream, like myself, I mainly do packaging this, uh, the, this year, can actually go upstream. There are people that were in the work in the distros that got a KDE developer account and then can actually improve the software directly. Uh, and we are also testing with different configurations that we can, can fathom as well. So the, 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 the matter is, Let's work together to improve software. It's not necessarily mean that we have to agree with everyone all the time. Got the time? Yeah. Great. <laughs> next. Who's next? Uh, quick. Yeah. Oh. oh, sorry. Uh, uh, is not missing. Come and give a talk. Make, make with the screen. <laughs> the time's up. You have four minutes and it's running. Yeah. <laughs> ah. Tell us about app images. Um, app images are awesome. You should all use it. That's it. Thank also. you. <laughs> okay. It was well. I mean, it's pretty easy. One file, one app, everything in that single file, and. The whole point is that it's simple. It's simple to obtain, it's simple to maintain once that there's the infrastructure to create app images continuously. Uh, there are, of course, issues, and there are security issues that uh, should be accounted for, not just with the format itself, with the software, with the libraries, and one way to have a solution for it is to use Firegel. We act in Nitrux, which is the Linux distribution that me and my buddies over there develop. We utilize Firegel to do the sandboxing. Um, there are some notable app, app images available already. Uh, Krita and KDN Live are notable examples of them. There are also non KDE apps such as LibreOffice. There is GIMP, there is um, uh, Audacious, and there are many other. A uh, Blender is also an app image. It doesn't require installation because 
it's just one file, it's executable, you just download it and add the permissions for it and it's going to run. There's no runtime, there's no store, you just download it and run it. Uh, additional desktop integration is something that uh, the app image developers are working on. Typically, you just download a file, but it doesn't get integrated into the into the desktop environment. Like you don't get a an icon on the menus. You don't get uh, something like a Dolphin service to update the app image. So there are programs like App Image D, which it, which uh, monitors the directories where the app images are stored. There is App Image Launcher, which helps with integration with the desktop environment. And there's the newly App Image Services, which basically aims to unify everything else. Um, another point with the App Images is that there isn't a central store. Basically, a, like the whole gist of it is that you, the, you, the developer, develop the application, you put the tarball, and using continuous integration such as Travis CI, GitLab CI, you build the app image and the user gets it directly from you without any intermediaries. And no, that's not mine. <laughs> okay, so coming to a similar technology like app image, uh, we have uh, Flatpak. Uh, Flatpak is a framework to uh, uh, make a uh, uh, for running uh, desktop and uh, running and distributing desktop uh, uh, applications on Linux. Uh, the applications, unlike AppImage, uh, they run in a sandbox uh, environment, which means they are isolated from your system and which has uh, security benefits. Of course, uh, you cannot have complete sandboxing uh, because the application wouldn't have access to network uh, or some other stuff, so we need to make holes. Or for some other stuff, we have portals to access uh, files outside the sandbox. And the uh, idea of Flatpak is to make uh, everything as uh, easy as possible. So with Flatpak, you can run, run it everywhere and build it, build it, build it everywhere. Uh, Flatpak has this concept of runtimes, uh, where the most common uh, basic libraries are in the runtime. That's just a, like a, the base uh, package. And you just build applications on top of that, uh, adding just uh, some specific libraries required uh, for the specific application. And it, it's, uh, you can run it on almost every distribution. And the same is, uh, goes for building. You don't need to install anything on your distribution. You just install the runtime and SDK, which has uh, all the libra libraries and uh, compilators and everything. So the builds are reproducible. So if you build it, manage to build one flat pack on one distribution, uh, it will build on uh, every other distribution where you have flat pack. And then we have uh, flat, flat hub which is uh, like the main repository uh, for Flatpaks. It serves as a repository and build service. And it's managed by Flatpak people and also I think for, by people from Endless. Uh, yeah, it can be used uh, by everyone. You can simply add uh, this repository to every distribution where you have Flatpak. And you can uh, simply add your application there and maintain it. Uh, the Flatpak manifest, which are like the recipes for building Flatpaks. Everything is hosted on GitHub. So you have access to all the Flatpaks, so of to all the manifests. You can send patches to all the applications you can found there and maintain your application there. It's really easy. And you can use uh, Flathub to bu build it and distribute your application. Uh, it's also pre-installed or uh, on many, I think some distributions already uh, have FlatHub enabled by default. For example, in Fedora, I think. And last time I counted, there are 36 KD applications like Dolphin, Krita, Ocular, Conversation. And besides KD applications, there are like uh, Spotify, Steam, Telegram, so the most common ones. 
and uh, go a bit into Flatpak details. So uh, the format uh, Flatpak uses OS3, which is like a uh, Git uh, for uh, distributions. So it has all the benefits of Git. Uh, you can go back uh, to previous versions. Uh, you, when you like updating, you just download the diff, so you don't always have to download the whole application again, again for new uh, updates. Uh, you can also host your repositories. It's uh, because, uh, like Git, you can you just uh, build your application. You can upload it uh, everywhere, and anyone can use it as a repository. And uh, okay, so that, that's it. Uh, for more information, if you want, we have uh, both on Thursday in the morning. So if you want to discuss more flat pack. Then. Okay. I'll do without the microphone. No, it's a really bad recording. The acoustics is really bad. Hello, Igor from Canonical. Thank you for coming to the session. I want to talk to you about Snaps and Snapcraft. Lovely image. What we have is self-contained applications that can run on uh, Linux distributions that support Snaps. We have three musketeers. We have the SnapD service, which enables the functionality. We have the Snap user space component, so that you can install and run your uh, applications. And then we have the Snap store, where all the applications are hosted and originate from. And finally, we have Snapcraft, the command line tool to actually build applications. So Snapcraft is a pretty nifty thing. We use files in a YAML format. So if you know YAML, you can start building your applications to be uh, uh, distributable as Snaps. Then we have backends that are based on virtual machines or containers. You can use both, depending on your setup. You can do local builds. You can do remote builds in our, uh, in our system if you don't have resources and build for other architectures, in total six architectures. You can also use an interactive build system that we have available online. Then, once you have built your uh, applications, you push them to the store. The store is a web front end. Is discoverable by millions of, of users and not just Ubuntu folks, although we support Ubuntu from 14.04 onwards. We also support 41 other distributions. So if you have Manjaro, if you have Fedora, if you have CentOS, Debian, you're also welcome to use applications. And all software is welcome to the store. So once you have published your uh, application, there is the maintenance part, which is not negligible. And there is an element of updates and an element of uh, reliability for the end users. So you have uh, transactional automatic updates. And if there is a fail failure, there's going to be a rollback, which means that you retain the functionality and you do not uh, disrupt your user sessions. You can also do parallel installs. So you can test your application as developers or as users. You can have multiple versions in, at the same time running in parallel. For instance, you can install two instances of Ocular, and they'll be completely separate applications. Once you have your users, you can track metrics. You can track your usage by version, by distribution. So you can actually see how your application is trending, correlated to your social media activities, or other ways how you promote applications. By the way, we can help you with that as well. 94 KD applications at the store and counting, working closely with Jonathan here. Then, working closely with other members of the KDE community, we have a build snap, which simplifies the build process. We have plugins for many programming languages. We have CMake, we have uh, all sorts. We'll talk about it a little more. We have content snaps, so once you distribute a KDE application, you don't get the whole bunch of megabytes. It's all contained in one elegant snap, and your application is just a delta on top of that. Very elegant for streamlined distributions. How much, sorry? One, one minute, no problem. There's also an experimental Plasma desktop, so you can actually try that as a snap. And there's a KD extension that's uh, in the pipeline so that everything I've mentioned will be even simpler. Here's a visual uh, representation of what it looks like when you use the content snap. Basically, you declare it. And the KD guys have done all the magic for you. So you streamline and save time. As I mentioned, KD uh, extension that's coming. Tomorrow, there's a buff. Uh, we'll be doing software distribution, how you build snaps. You're welcome to join the session. Thank you for your time. Next slide, and oh, that's me again. Uh, so when we launched KDE Neon, we uh, looked at how KDE software was uh, compiled and distributed, and we thought, well, we can bring modern techniques to it, the continuous integration, the continuous development, continuous quality assurance, the continuous deployment, um, and do it for not just the stable stuff, but also directly from Git, so that it can be used as a, as a developer tool and a testing tool. Um, I think that's my only slide. Yep. So 
so we have a build from tars, we build from git, um, and it's available as uh, apt packages and, and as doc docker images. Uh, and we also build the snap packages now. Now, building the snap packages in Neon is done because it's convenient and the infrastructure was there, but it should be done more integrated into the applications uh, rather than in a, in a separate standalone uh, KDE project. Uh, but we were definitely keen to bring uh, application de development and deployment directly into KDE. Um, so yeah, Craft is a kind of a um, package manager for Windows and Mac. It originates from KDE on Windows. Um, it was mainly source-based, so you had to compile everything from source. Since a few years, we got um, binary packages that are basically a cache. So you run, build Kate, and you'll get a Kate um, set up within a few minutes, even with not the fastest internet connection. Um, we support Windows and Mac, and yeah, that's the way how to get this get started on Windows and Mac. Um, to help with that, we also have the um, binary factory, which is basically CI for nightly builds for uh, those platforms. In the beginning, it was only Windows. Now we got also Mac, and all the other platforms like Flatpak and Android is also hosted there. So um, for Windows and Mac. Point, you can point your users there to get their installer for those platforms. Um, not everything's stable, and even if you ask us to put the software on this page, it, you're not supported on this platform. That means you get an installer, but you're supposed to test your software yourself and say, yeah, it's working, and if it's so, upload it somewhere else and um, tell it to your users. Um, on Windows, you usually um, have an installer, which is a binary that just copies files in some locations. Um, that's the old way how we distribute software. We are currently working on getting software into the store. KStars is currently the only application there, but we are working on getting, firstly, updates for KStars. And of course, we try to get Kate and other applications to the store because that's more convenient to reach users. And yeah, for um, Mac, we don't have support for the store yet. We can create DMG images, so um, they are on site. So there's still room for improvement, but users can install them and run them locally, and it should work. As same as with Windows, please test your application before you promote it as working and don't directly link to binary factory, and those are rolling releases or just nightlies that aren't stable links. Um, for the store, that's a different uh, topic. We need to find solutions there, so that's not only code signing, but also um, you're not allowed to use all APIs we do use currently, so uh, could get hard. And next one. I just wanted to include everything in here because there are many different distribution channels that our users these days will expect us to use. And if we don't, then the users will not care about us. And so Steam is a very popular distribution channel uh, for games and graphics stuff. Um, and we use it for Krita and Je Compris. No, and so, so we only have one app there. And yet here's a great way to distribute our software that we're not making use of. And that seems a shame. Incidentally, Krita has been on there for quite a while, and it's going very well. It's one of their biggest uh, income sources. And, and Krita have a business model around this as well, which is great. Uh, similarly, for Google Play, there's a very popular app store, very popular way for uh, software to get distributed. And we have KStars, and we do have Shake and Pre, right? And uh, not much else there. Uh, KDE Connect, of course. Um, but again, there's a popular way for people to get software, and we should make sure that we use it. F-Droid, another way for people to get software. Um, it's more aligned with our ethos and, and community spirit and freedom, um, and yet we only have one app there rather than all of our apps. And again, the Apple App Store, as, as Hannah said, is, is not much used, but allegedly Krita is on there. It's hard even to know what's on there because you can't browse this on the web. Right, and I'm going to try and run through Get Hot News stuff uh, in about two minutes. Uh, it used to be owned by a company called Hivo One uh, and was very recently sold uh, to a 
separate entity to the KDE EV, uh, but it is legally bound to the EV, which means that KDE now has complete control over the KDE store. Um, there is this, the only reason it cannot be uh, moved over is something which aligns perfectly with our goal of privacy. Uh, we, uh, there is a strong uh, personal data protection legislation in Germany, which means that that data cannot go to the EV. It has to be kept in that separate entity. Um, Get Hot New Stuff itself is a uh, free desktop.org specification, um, which is an XML-based specification for uh, content delivery um, and review uh, and everything surrounding that sort of thing. It is entirely content type agnostic. Um, you've all run into it, where there is a little star on a button and it says get something. That's uh, get hot new stuff. Um, anyone can upload uh, new content to the store. Um, it is currently, uh, it, it is now being put under the same umbrella. It's now all store.kd.org, uh, but there used to be some 130 odd websites. Um, they still all exist, but they now point to um, the store. Uh, it's also used to be uh, basically just controlled by a, a small nondescript set of people who happen to look at it and be able to remove stuff from the store. There is now a uh, socially involved process by which people can, you know, uh, ask for things to be marked as wrong or, yeah, there, there's a, a proper feedback system for it. Now, uh, we have a revenue sharing system, which is a strange thing for something which isn't a technically a store. There is no way of actually buying stuff on there. Um, but any one in here who has uploaded stuff to the store will have noticed uh, a bit on the site that says plings, uh, which is a way of measuring uh, how many downloads you've had over the course of the previous month, and then you get a share of uh, the uh, revenue that the store has brought in via advertising. Um, if you want to know more, uh, I have a chat in about an hour and a half. Uh, over there, <laughs> um, and yeah. Uh, so the more directly related item in this talk would be Discover. Um, and Discover is our own application and add-on manager. It is installed anywhere that you have a Plasma desktop, which means it's on OpenSUSE. Uh, we discovered recently that it is also on the, uh, if you install the uh, Plasma desktop, uh, meta package on uh, Debian. You also have it. It's on Netrunner and Kubuntu and a whole bunch of other places as well. Um, and uh, obviously, it's the primary software center on KDE Neon. Uh, it has support for consuming all of the things that all of the people here have just talked about, um, including the one that I just talked about as well. Um, it is a central place for uh, handling all of your con all of your applications and your add-ons, it is not a package manager, um, but that's something we can go into a bit more. But it is what users will expect it to be these days, which is displays applications and all their other add-ons and all the other goodies that users will care about. Yeah. Uh, so. When we use these channels uh, to ship our stuff to our users, we need to care about it after we've done the tarball. We need to care about it and take on the new responsibilities. So that includes security announces, making sure that the software is updated, um, but also there's, there's money that can be involved and we have to make the choice for applications, uh, whether or not we want, to, we want to monetize them in some way or other, and at the moment, the, the KDE uh, doesn't have very good structures or doesn't have any structures for supporting that. Jay Compri does monetize their app, um, but he has to do it all himself, right? And, and we need to find a way within KDE that applications can, can decide in an open and transparent way uh, in what way they're going to monetize their app and uh, who's going to then decide what to do with money and when. And that's something that we should embrace and we shouldn't be scared of it. We should uh, embrace it and do it in an open way that works for the best uh, works for the best for our application maintainers. 
uh, and then we can't even decide which way to name the KDE applications bundle, and this is an example of this sort of uh, problem where, where it's a relatively trivial matter, but because we don't have a process for deciding how to, how to solve it, uh, then it just gets stuck, and we end up with a case where, well, we have a website that lists all the KDE applications, but we also release the KDE applications thing, and the name is duplicated, and uh, it feels a bit confusing, but there's no process within KDE for solving that. And as I said earlier, there's no process for marking stuff as unmaintained, and we've got to make sure we remove the stuff when it no longer becomes useful. So we have a panel now. How does this work? One minute to spare. <laughs> Can I just mention that this story about the Italians? Uh, um, microphone, surely. Microphone, please, yes. <laughs> Um, also, if you would like to think about some questions, awesome. Uh, Leo talked about the Italian catalog. We're not there either. That is very true. We are not on that catalog. There um, are zero KD apps there. We could have 100% of KD apps there. Yeah. Um, as far as I understand, um, Jonathan Riddle here has just spent some time in Westminster talking to government people. Was that something that... Yeah. And unfortunately, the UK government has more important issues on its mind than <laughs> free software, which is a shame. Um, but but open source certainly needs to, as a as a ethos, and there's a lot of work to get that into the sphere of government. We need to take every opportunity we can to get it into the sphere of government, um, including issues like, well, how do you actually get and install this software? Well, now we have answers for how do you get our software, um, and why you should use it, and and who are KDE, and we should be able to embrace governments when, whenever we have the possibility. Questions? Yep. So this is about the, the, the social uh, social uh, re responses, like uh, user content on the on the apps themselves. Do you have a, a generic policy on on whether or not you retain the right to reuse this content? Because as you said, there were 150 websites previously. Um, uh, obviously, th the reuse of that content potentially inside other applications that on a context may not be arranged very well, or it may be. Um, that that is. Yeah, very, very good question. Yeah, it's not very clear in a lot of ways, um, but every piece of content on the KDE store uh, has an explicit license. Um, and it is suggested that that uh, license should be a free software license of some description. Uh, there is an entry for proprietary, uh, but as far as I'm aware, very, very few entries have chosen that one. Uh, which means that there is things like it's usually a Creative Commons license if it is content, uh, which then is the reuse of the content is then that's explicitly stated in which particular version of the Creative Commons license you picked. Um, then there's the various DPL type licenses as well. Um, so yeah, it, it's explicitly uh, stated for each piece of content. I'm not sure if I'm going off topic from your question, but I interpreted it as how do you, who decides what gets to be on which distribution channel and who decides on the rights over it. And for KDE Neon, that's easy. We ship anything in KDE, and so that decision gets taken by the KDE community, and those processes sometimes can be a bit slow and bureaucratic. The incubator, it's easy to get stuck there. KDE Review, it's easy to get stuck there. As I say, it's hard, surprisingly hard to get it listed as unmaintained, um, but so we could do with making that a lot smoother. Yes, so how do you get, who decides what gets on the Snap Store and and who looks after it? Well, I guess it's up to the developer to decide what's the easiest way for them to distribute their software. After all, it's their product, it's their users. And I wouldn't say that this needs to be uh, anything else than the convenience and loyalty to your users. So whatever you find most convenient, that should be your choice, um, and base it on the most critical factors that you have for your software. Is it retention? Is it the reliability of the software? Is it how difficult it is for you to package and distribute? Is it social elements? So this may be a roundabout answer, but I wouldn't say that you go for a specific store because of the store. You go because you have needs, and then you find the product that suits your uh, requirements the best. 
if anyone wants to add to that. Okay. okay. <laughs> Just to decide who gets in in what. At least, disclaimer: I'm talking about my personal experience. I don't know how it goes with the other distributions like Debian, Ubuntu, uh, Arch Linux, whatever. I know about OpenSUSE. Basically, anyone can actually submit anything to uh, as a contribution. It goes through a review, basically, with the people that actually do most of the work. In at this time, me and a few others, but there's no pre prejudicial. The only vetting, hard vetting, is actually that the, the, your software needs to play well with the, with the rest, which means most of the time it builds, it builds with the, the distribution. Okay, let's go. Uh, there are the only special cases uh, for licensing for new packages. You have to make sure it's compatible. And uh, uh, in case uh, sometimes there are changes, for example, in the build flags. Uh, recently, the, we had the link time optimization added, and uh, it broke. Came in, came in money. There was an error, but it, uh, only the, that option actually made it uh, show up. But basically, the process is not free for all. But basically, anyone can go sign up, um, get an account, and actually contribute to the to a distribution. I don't know about the others, but this is how how, how it works for KDE software in OpenSUSE. I'm not sure about FlatHub, whether there are some restrictions about the software which can go there. Because there's also some proprietary stuff like NVIDIA drivers. So I guess so almost everything could go there. So I haven't seen any restrictions so far on FlatHub or anything, any submission which would be rejected. So yeah, just the application needs to follow some guidelines so like the there's a, like upstream uh, metadata has to be like uh, valid uh, and the application needs to match uh, the upstream metadata and so on, but uh, not sure about any other restrictions. Any more questions? Any questions? Yeah, so, so I'm uh, distributing my uh, KGAB, which is the, 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 the KDE version of the GAB app, uh, the, which is infamous. I'm not actually doing it, but would that be a problem with anybody? And is there any mechanism that you can, can do to maybe intervene and say this is not aligned with our social or political uh, ecosystem? Or, or, or would this not be a problem? It's an easy answer for the KDE store. The GAB app is not compatible with the COC. So if, for that one, it's very straightforward. <laughs> um, I don't know about anybody else. I don't know the details, but. Is it part of KDE? And if it is, then we'll put it in Neon. It's, it's, it's like a Mastodon. It's like a Mastodon instance, but then for the Nazi, U.S. Nazi community. So it's a very aggressive, anti-gay, anti-immigrant, anti-anything. So it's it's a branded version of a, a hate speech. Oh, interesting ethics. So what 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 if the app includes or points people towards hate speech, particularly? Um, as I say, in the case of KDE Neon, it's up to uh, it's up to the Kitty community on the whole, and I don't think we've ever had that sort of issue, but if we would, we would surely have a good long discussion about it. <laughs> Likewise, I have not encountered situations like that. That would be uh, a very deliberate discussion to understand exactly the impact and make the right decision. But again, this is beyond software. This is a possibly even political question, so I don't know. In the past, there have been porn lookup sites and stuff like that that for a while were in Debian, but they never made it into Ubuntu. And I know that Kubuntu, we decided, no, we don't want that. In the case of the distributions, these kind of things usually are hands-on distribution-wide. Usually there are policies that define uh, how things are kept and the uh, behavior and whatnot, the various on distribution. Basically, everything needs to, 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 to stand up to the, to, to the community guidelines. Basically, if there is a problem, as uh, basically a process like Jonathan mentioned, for, you know, if there is a problem, let's talk about it and see what actually can be done to fix it. This is basically in short, because it, it doesn't involve 
it goes be as I said, it goes beyond KDE and the software. In my opinion, for the distribution, it goes the, the whole community behind the distribution, and f furthermore, even more than that. Um, uh, if I remember right, the Gab uh, people closed source some of Mastodon's um, infrastructure, uh, so I think you'll be able to kick them out on that. Oh, the clients, yeah, no, 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 this was the server. So uh, I have a small feedback about you know uh, spreading word and marketing the KD. So what happens uh, at least in Indian colleges is that uh, uh, people want something. So let's uh, suppose uh, they want to download a, uh, you know uh, they want to check a software which download stored in file. So they know, don't know if okay. So, okay. so, uh, so they don't know if uh, KTorrent exists, and similar is the case with uh, other applications also. And at the same time, like you know, whenever uh, uh, if someone asks there what to install as a good distro, everyone says, okay, install Ubuntu with no and it's good, it's simple, and it's a beginner friendly. But I've never heard anyone say, you know, like install KD Neon or install Plasm, it's quite good. So you know, like as a feedback, it would be quite good if uh, you know, like KD applications and a distro as a whole, you know, like can be. Uh, more marketed and promoted. So it reads uh, like a wider audience. I think we can agree there. Yes. Yeah, I don't think anybody in particular uh, disagrees that uh, we need to do more and more sort of specific marketing on, on particular applications and uh, the base like the basic quality of our software in general, because you know, being as this is a software community that originated in Germany amongst engineers, everybody is really happy to um, talk about the negative points of our software, and these are the things that we need to fix, and this is yeah, we need to you know, we we don't want to release something which isn't perfect, and that is true, but at the same time. We also have some software which is frankly awesome. Now, most people in here are not aware of this, but I do not use that word more than like five times a year. <laughs> um, and yeah, we have some really amazing software and it's, it, yeah, we need to talk about that more. It, that, would be, that would be good. And all of these various distribution uh, methods, all of these various types of uh, ways of getting our software um, helps all of every single one of them, right? Helps with that um, in uh, you know in different ways as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, also, I know that the uh, promo team is hiring, uh, <laughs> not like money, but <laughs> yeah, no, like I give, yeah, like you know, if you have. Like, if you have specific ideas for, oh, I, by the way, there is an app that just had a new release and uh, it, I didn't, you know, it didn't really get any marketing or, you know, it's totally a thing. Like, uh, the promo team has a uh, calendar for uh, release announcements and just general promo work. Um, and if you come to the promo team with a, uh, an app in need of some help for marketing, um, they will find a spot in the calendar for you, and it will, you know, be made to happen. <laughs> the best calendar. The best calendar, absolutely. <laughs> uh, we have, on the, so one of the issues that we had recently was with the KD Applications Bundle, was working out should the um, re release announcement for that point directly to the Snap Store and the Flatpak Store, and. We had some very long discussions for that, and to me, it's a no-brainer. Of course, we should point to places where people can get our software. And we had long discussions with it because it wasn't not everything was included in every store, and there wasn't a, a single page that was necessarily up to date that could be pointed at. Uh, so I would say to the store people, get a get a publisher page, which I've said lots to everyone, but. It, it feels like a no-brainer that you should be able to go, well, what are all the KDE applications here? Um, for the Android 
uh, store and the other ones, again, it's part of the problem that because KDE doesn't support applications being monetized and being put on the more commercial-minded stores, the Windows One, Mac, um, that they're not all done under one account, and so you can't easily search for what's all this stuff from KDE. And so in our announcements, we also can't, um, we also can't have a sim simple link saying, if you use this store, then here's a great way to get some of our software. Um, and that's another reason why our structures and processes should be improved to allow projects to be able to use those stores in the way that suits them when they want to monetize it or otherwise. Um, I had another point. I can't remember what it is. I have a question. Well, I have an idea. We have a distributions list that isn't used very much because right now it's mostly overlapped by the packagers list, which is for distros and packaging issues with KDE. Yeah. Right. But I think we should set, we should widen the scope of the distributions list to make it about distributing the software to everybody and talk more about how we can make sure that every single application is properly promoted as this is Yeah, no you're wrong. Uh, you know, for flat pack, for f app image, for snaps, for you know the Italian catalog, everywhere, and get people talking about it in that list that's about that stuff. It's not necessary. I mean, part of it, it, what you're talking about, is a community issue, as in monetizing and where the money goes. But to me, that's pretty easy because it starts out tiny, and and it could just be bringing someone to Academy that otherwise we couldn't afford to bring to Academy, or having one more sprint. It's not like we're selling ourselves to the devil or something. <laughs> Any more questions? Uh, yeah, so the distributions list was once upon a time for, uh, it was a, intended to be an extremely low uh, traffic uh, mailing lists for uh, issues p that all distributions would want to pay attention to. I am thinking that that is now covered by the security list. Pretty much all of those issues are done there that are not covered by the packages list. So the distributions list could be opened up to becoming something well, effectively more useful, I guess, more well-defined as well. <laughs> So um, I shall also have a, uh, two questions. The first is, would it be possible to sort of create a magnet link that includes all of your stores so that when somebody in clicks on a link says, well, whatever package manager I have on my system, and then just have a single unified link and then be able to process it? Or is that beyond the collaboration that you're willing to, to, to have? And, and the second is, uh, this is for the Snap, Flatpak, and, and App Image ones. Is it possible to use some sort of an upstream notification of uh, just like get the hot new stuff kind of this is a new there's a new version of this one don't use this, this version anymore because it's unsafe is is is, is that kind of data flow arranged among so the, all of you the first question i won't touch on the second one because i don't honestly know <laughs> um, but the first question sounds like something which would be covered by uh, there is now a uh, a, a URL handler uh, in KDE called the apps called AppStream, right? So if you give it the AppStream name of an application, it will, in most cases, it will launch Discover and show you that page, and then give you whatever um, version is available in your priority list. I am thinking it doesn't work on mine. Uh, I've broken Discover on my local install because I'm working on it. <laughs> you can try. It might work. <laughs> it'll, it'll be on that screen anyway. You Maybe can't see it. There will also be a torrent effect, so people could share, basically share the downloads. I don't know how much bandwidth um, there is, but... Uh, yeah. That, that's more of a... That's slightly lower in the stack, I guess, but yeah. I, guess. I can give an answer to the second question. So with Snaps, you get automatic updates. So if the developer has published an update to their software, you will receive that update automatically. So you do not need to worry about uh, that aspect. However, if the developer has not published an update to their application, 
there is a problem. But that's a generic issue where whether developers are committed to maintaining and updating their software, especially when there are security patches. If that element is covered, you're covered too transparently. Okay, uh, with uh, Flatpak and Flathub, uh, this situation is basically the same. Just uh, what is unfortunate that uh, many uh, many applications in Flathub currently are not maintained by the, by the actual developers. So it's like mostly like in distributions where packagers uh, maintain uh, applications on behalf of some, someone else. So in the ideal world, uh, the application would be maintained by actual developers who who like know uh, whether there's something broken or, so, or something like that. So that's something we will need to improve in future. We will need to get uh, like the actual developer to care about the packages in Snap, Snapcraft, and FlatHub. But yeah, the, the current situation is that uh, it's mostly up to the packager if he knows. So it, it's the same if you publish the, uh, an update, it automatically goes to the user. And uh, yeah, if there is a problem with, with that update, uh, basically the only thing the user can do is to report uh, an issue on GitHub, but, but that's it, or, or just uh, revert the update, but uh, yeah. Second question is just on the afterwards. And um, no, uh, what, was, uh, what was the first question again? So I think uh, well, the, the best thing I forgot. Ah, yes, yes. It, uh, basically, yes. You, uh, what, uh, the, what said earlier, yes. It was, any sane distribution, I don't think mine is saner, but maybe. Uh, should, uh, personally I don't use Discover, but I know people who do. Um, it should actually work. I, I mean, at least I've, I've been trying to do this in KLAN a couple of uh, days ago in, in my session, and it offered me to install packages uh, through Discover just by typing the name. So I think it works. If the, your system is originally configured, it should work also for even if you don't have any access to the app stores. And this is the live demo for the Kitty Applications uh, website. Um, and if you click on the install button it, on the applications page, it takes you to an AppStream uh, URL. Just to show how um, pioneering this is, I guess, within the concepts of, of uh, Linux on the desktop stuff, um, the, the specification was incomplete and mixed up URL and URI, and um, it doesn't necessarily work. And as Says it, it probably doesn't work on his computer. Um, so we need to make sure that um, hold our hold our distributions and, and app stores to account to make sure that um, these app stream URIs are integrated in such a way that they all work for all the different applications. And that means automated QA to do that. And uh, that's a task that needs to be done. Any more questions? So I also had one question. So what are your thoughts about like labeling some of the softwares on KDE application pages as, for example, different standards, gold standard, silver standard, bronze standard. So these are the applications that are stable, supported, will work everywhere. Uh, what's your th thought on that? So like these are the applications that will always have like security updates ready for them. Uh, when I put together the applications web page, I did have to work out well which what is the definitive list of our applications, and it's not a simple answer. And um, did have to work out well which ones are maintained, but also some of them, we have some applications which are listed on the applications page which don't actually have a release yet, um, and so arguably they shouldn't be on there until this release because it's not necessary to be useful to users. Um, and our processes are not great for doing that. When we are aware that stuff doesn't get updated, well, the beauty of KDE is that we're a community, and once you get into it, then everyone has access to everything, and so we can co-maintain it. And so the beauty of um, that, that process is that, um, well, anyone can and does help fix stuff when it's needed, and if nobody's doing that, then that means it should be marked unmaintained. 
Yeah. Well, um, from our perspective, if the snap is in the store, it should work on all the supported distributions, the 41. Whether the application is actually of high quality and the functional logic of it is silver, bronze, or gold, that's up to the developer. I mean, you can put an application that does nothing, it will work beautifully everywhere. Is it useful? Probably not. Personally, I, I, I really don't agree with tiring applications because it also depends on the users. Okay, I'll make a controversial statement here. PIM, most of people hate it. I love it. Uh, so, and it depends on the users. Also, uh, depending on uh, application being unmaintained, as Jonathan mentioned. Actually, we have a lot of applications that actually work well, but they're not really actually maintained in the sense that they get a, a constant developer flow. Think of the games. They work basically almost on their own. Perhaps they have a few bugs here and there, but basically they don't get a lot of developer atten uh, attention, but still they, they could be classified as working. So I think it's quite too subjective to do this in, um, for, the, for, for tiring. And personally, I'm glad that distributions don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, yeah, a, 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 a one example of that would be uh, that the current version of Amarok would be marked as unmaintained. Uh, it is based on Qt4. Uh, basically, there is no distribution left in the world that still ships it. Uh, it changed on OpenSUSE last week. Except, except us, yes, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, on, on Tumbleweed, it got removed. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's... But the problem there being, there is a version of Amarok which is in development for Qt5, uh, which then is available on some distributions, and some distributions it became installed in place of the Qt4 versions. Others, it simply removed Amarok. Um, uh, and you know, all in all, a degraded user experience, but if you go with a uh, unmaintained gold bronze uh, style uh, listing of the applications, Amarok would just be listed as unmaintained when the situation is that it is effectively maintained. It still gets the occasional release. It just isn't acceptable in distributions. Um, so, yeah, basically, back to what Jonathan said, it is not a straightforward problem. <laughs> no, we don't, we don't have distributed in Switzerland anymore. Yeah. It's not anymore. Yeah. Yeah. But I still have my Switzerland version of Amarok. Yeah. 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 But I still have that on my computer and still run. Yeah. I have it until I pick up the page and discover next. <laughs> Another feature that users expect to happen is user reviews and user feedback in a in a sort of fair and transparent way. And I think most people are quite savvy at knowing, well, this is a user review, so it'll be biased, and it'll be, uh, it, especially the people with a particular uh, grievance or something are likely to do it. So it, it's a limited way, but I think most people will be wise to that because, um, well, they see it everywhere from Amazon to every other website. Now, there is a GNOME web service that does reviews of um, applications, and that's integrated into Discover. It's an open question whether or not it should be integrated into the application's website or not. I don't know. Or maybe a link. I don't know. Certainly the application's website, those AppStream URLs, they're great for uh, Linux desktop users. Um, but we support other app stores. And it's future work to be done to uh, have this point to a Google Play Store or Windows Store or all the other stores um, to make sure that uh, people know everywhere that they can get it. Yeah, so obviously I have a vested interest in people using the open collaboration services, but the particular service here, uh, ODRS, is a, effectively a subset of the functionality of a static version of open collaboration service, um, and it works. Um, it changed recently. We had to do a minor fix, but it works. Um, and for that sort of thing, yeah, um, it's um, like Jonathan says. It's when we are dealing with reasonably savvy users here. Um, they, uh, people are aware today of what user 
reviews mean. And yeah, I think we can, like we have two options, right? We can either ignore the ability to do user reviews or we can allow them and then hope that people understand what they're for. <laughs> Uh, I just want to add, uh, going back to the MRAC, uh, that in case of snap on f or flatback, if uh, like a base library like Qt4 uh, disappears from your distribution, you have uh, in case of flatback a snap or uh, basically you just bundle the library inside uh, into uh, with the application itself, so uh, it just gives you like more work of the maintenance but you still can ship your uh, application even when some older library is removed from, uh, removed from the base. So you still have uh, a way of solving this problem. So I think, mark, uh, I think you are running out of time. Yeah. So if anybody of you have any more questions, you can you know, talk to any one of them later on. So we'll thank you so much, complete panel. It was a useful discussion.